All right, welcome back everybody. This is our third Beowulf lesson, and we are jumping in in Seamus Haney's version. So go ahead and open up your PDF or your book. There's my sticky note on it, there you go. Um, you're gonna scroll down to page 35, and you're going to read along with me as I teach you the lesson. Okay, now when we left off, our boy Beowulf, right, was, had arrived at Herat, been received in glory by the king and the guards, been invited to party with the, uh, with the Danes, and um, had kind of been warned about how awful Grendel was. And he'd made a boast that he was going to defeat Grendel or fight Grendel with no weapons and no armor because Grendel doesn't use that either. Okay, so they were having a big party and then we're going to pick up um, during the party at the king's feet. So the king is sitting kind of, you know, up in his in his chair and probably on a raised dais and near his feet would be like his relatives and his trusted people right his best people so uh, we're gonna pick up with line 499 from where he crouched at the king's feet Unferth a son of Iglaf's spoke contrary words all right so we we're getting who his father is right and um, he is not happy that Beowulf is there. Beowulf's coming, his sea brave, braving, made him sick with envy. He could not brook or abide the fact that anyone else alive under heaven might enjoy greater regard than he did. So, oh, you've all met these people, right? Somebody walks in and they're being rewarded for something or they're going to do something. And these other people get really jealous because someone else is getting more attention or somebody else is getting a prize. That's our boy Unferth. We don't like him very much. He's a hater. Are you the Beowulf who took on Brekka in a swimming match on the open sea, risking water just to prove you could win? It was sheer vanity that made you venture out into the main deep. And no matter who tried, friend or foe, to deflect the pair of you, neither would back down. The sea test obsessed you. Okay, so he's all like, are you that same Beowulf who you and Brekka were having a race in the ocean, like a, a swimming competition, and everybody told you you were crazy and you did it anyway? You waded in, embraced water, taking its measure, mastering the currents, riding the swell. This all sounds like praise, right? The ocean swayed, winter went wild in the waves, but you vied for seven nights, and then he outswam you, came ashore the stronger contender. He was cast up safe and sound one morning among the Hethroims, then made his way to where he belonged in Brodding country, home again, sure of his ground, in strong room and brawn. So Brucka made good his boast upon you, and was proved right. No matter, therefore, how you may have fared in every bout and battle until now, this time you'll be worsted. No one has ever outlasted an entire night against Grendel. So, He's bringing up the one time he thinks Beowulf failed, right? In this swimming contest with Brekka. Brekka got to the shore first. And they swam for seven nights. And, and it, pfft, all right, well, maybe you've had some successes, but you failed then and you're going to fail now because no one's ever beat Grendel. No one ever has survived the night. Now, if you can understand, of course, that Beowulf is not going to take this sitting down, but he has to walk a very careful line because... Obviously, Unferth is a favorite of the king, right? He's sitting at the king's feet. If the king didn't like him, he'd be way on the other side of the mead hall. So he's, Beowulf has to, one, answer Unferth in a way that says, you know, I don't care what you think about me. Uh, I am going to win. But also, he's got to, like, walk that line not insulting one of the king's kinsmen. Yeah, watch what he does. Picking up on 
529. Beowulf, Echothrau's son, replied, Well, friend Unferth, you have had your say about Brecca and me, but it was mostly beer that was doing the talking. So he's giving Unferth like a way out. He's like, Unferth, all right, all right, you said what you said, but you were drunk. The truth is this, when the going was heavy in those high waves, I was the strongest swimmer of all. We've been children together, and we grew up daring e ourselves to outdo each other, boasting and urging each other to risk our lives on the sea. Okay, you probably know people like this. Maybe you are a person like this, right? You've known someone forever, and you're always, like, daring each other or challenging each other to do something else. Yeah? Okay. Now, here's how they swam, him and Brecca. Each of us swam holding a sword, a naked, hard-proofed blade for protection against the whale beasts. Poor whales. Uh, so they, the, the sword doesn't have a scabbard. It's just the blade. But Brecca could never move out farther or faster than me, than, from me than I could manage to move from him. So they were kind of like deadlocked. They were neck and neck. Shoulder to shoulder, we struggled on for five nights until the long flow and pitch of the waves, the perishing cold, the nights falling and winds from the north drove us apart. So until night five, they were neck and neck and swimming next to each other. And then a storm comes up. And you remember, we've, we've read some of those poems with the storms in them. We know how bad they are. And it pushed them apart. The deep boiled up, and its wallowing sent the sea brutes wild. So all these sea monsters are coming out in this storm, because of course they are. My armor helped me to hold out, my hard ringed chainmail hand forged and linked. So we, not only are they swimming with swords for seven nights, they're wearing chainmail. This sounds uh, unhealthy, but apparently it's very helpful because he's being attacked by sea monsters and this is keeping him alive. A fine, close-fitting filigree of gold. Now, why gold? Why would you make your chain mail that you're going to swim in from gold? Well, if you make it from iron, what happens when iron hits seawater? Exactly, it rusts. And gold is fairly light relatively speaking, fairly soft, and it doesn't rust. So, a fine, close-fitting filigree of gold kept me safe when some ocean creature pulled me to the bottom. Pinioned fast and swathed in its grip. Pinioned means, like, held out. So he's, he's like, pinned. And, and the, the monster, maybe an octopus or something like that, has him in the grip. I was granted one final chance. My sword plunged. So he stabs the thing with his sword. And the ordeal was over. Through my own hands, the battle of fury had finished off the sea beast. Time and again, foul things attacked me, lurking and stalking. But I lashed out, gave as good as I got with my sword. My flesh was not for feasting on. I love that line. And in fact, I have a t-shirt with my flesh is not for feasting on, on it. I may wear it next time. Uh, one of my students last year, when we were reading this, um, uh, knew I loved that line, and she actually made me a t-shirt, which is super cool. Um, anyway, uh, he's, he's bragging, but he's also saying, I'm not food for beasts. I'm better than that. My flesh was not for feasting on. There would be no monsters gnawing and gloating over their banquet at the bottom of the sea. Okay, and this is like foreshadowing, flash forward. Remember he said, if, I, if Grendel defeats me, there won't be a body because he's going to drag me off and eat me. And he's saying these monsters in this sea battle didn't get a chance to do that. They couldn't drag him off and eat him. My flesh was not for feasting on. So we're getting like... He's going to defeat Grendel, too, because he could defeat this. Instead, in the morning, mangled and sleeping the sleep of the sword. Oh, oh, that's so good, isn't it? Instead of, I killed them, they're sleeping the sleep of the sword. It's just so good. They slopped 
and floated like the ocean's leavings. So he just left all these dead monsters in his wake, sinking to the bottom of the ocean. From now on, sailors would be safe. The deep sea raids were over for good. Light came from the east, a bright guarantee of God, and the waves went quiet. I could see headlands and buffeted cliffs. So not only has he defeated these sea monsters and saved himself, he's actually made the sea safe for sailors and, and um, traders and everything else. So they're not going to get attacked at sea because he's killed the sea monsters. Similarly, if he kills Beowulf, sorry, he is Beowulf, if he kills Grendel, then the land and Herat again will be safe for people to travel and to sleep and to stay. Okay, so these are directly analogous events. He, the poet isn't just including the story for no reason. Often, for undaunted courage, fate spares the man it has not yet marked. Okay, remember we, when we did notes before about fate? He's like, fate hasn't marked me for death yet. However it occurred, my sword had killed nine sea monsters. Count them on first, nine. Such night dangers and hard ordeals I have never heard of, nor of a man more desolate in surging waves. But worn out as I was, I survived, came through with my life. The ocean lifted and laid me ashore. I landed safe on the coast of Finland. Okay, so maybe he didn't win the, the, the swimming contest. That's fine. He killed nine sea monsters and made the safe sea for sailors. All right, so I didn't win the contest, but uh, I think this was kind of more important, don't you? Now, okay, so if you're talking to one of your haters, as he is here, right, you don't just say to them, oh, well, the thing you're accusing me of, I actually did a, an awesome job about. You then turn it around on the hater, right? Watch what he does. Uh, jump down to the bottom of page 39, line 582. Now, I cannot recall any fight you entered, unfirth. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That bears comparison. I don't boast when I say that neither you nor Brecca were ever much celebrated for swordsmanship or facing danger on the field of battle. Okay, and now, are you ready? You ready? Beowulf's going to spill some tea here. Here you go. Hmm. You killed your own kith and kin. For all your cleverness and quick tongue, you will suffer damnation in the depths of hell. So you killed your own family. Wow. Wow. So, Unferth, don't you be running your mouth over the fact that I didn't win some swimming contest. You killed your own family. You're going to hell. The fact is, Unferth, if you were truly as keen or courageous as you claim to be, Grendel would never have gotten away with such unchecked atrocity. Attacks on your king, havoc in her rot, and horrors everywhere. So if you were as good as you claim to be, Grendel wouldn't stand a chance and he wouldn't be doing this to your kingdom. So you're actually a coward. So stop giving me a hard time. He's being very, very hard on him here, right? But he's not accusing him of anything that isn't true. But he, and he's talking about Grendel here, but he knows he need never be in dread of your blade making a mizzle of his blood. Or of vengeance arriving ever from this quarter. Of the victory shieldings or the shoulders of the spear. He knows you can trample down you Danes to his heart's content. Humiliate and murder without fear of reprisal. But he will find me different. I will show him how Geet's shaped to kill in the heat of battle. And this is his declaration, right? Remember, he's not just talking to Unferth. He's in front of the king. He's in front of all of the warriors, both his own guys and the Danes. He's saying, all right, I'm Beowulf, hear me roar, right? Then, whoever wants to go bravely to Mead when morning light 
scarfed in sun dazzle, shines forth from the south and brings another daybreak to the world. So he's going to make this safe for everybody. Then the gray-haired treasure giver was glad. So this is the king, remember, because the king is the treasure giver. Far famed in battle, the prince of bright Danes and keeper of his people counted on Beowulf, on the warrior's steadfastness and his word. So the laughter started. The din got louder. The crowd was happy. Okay, people think it's really funny that he just had a go at Unferth. Probably they've been waiting a very, very long time for someone to have a go at Unferth. And so the crowd is laughing and Unferth is mad, of course, but what's he going to do about it? Because the king likes Beowulf, so he doesn't have a thing to say. Yeah? Okay. Now we're going to meet the queen because, you know, if you're going to have a kingdom, you should have a queen. Wethelthro came in, Hrothgar's queen, observing the courtesies. So she's showing, she's coming in, and normally she doesn't want to be with all these loud guys, you know, hooting and hollering and have a good time. But she's going to do honor to Beowulf because they've got a special guest, right? And she's also been suffering as the kingdom's been suffering and as Hrothgar's been suffering. So her being a part of this is important. Also, isn't it nice to have a female character show up 41 pages into a book? Wethelthro came in, Hrothgar's queen, observing the courtesies. Adorned in her gold, she graciously saluted the men in the hall and then handed the cup first to Hrothgar, their homeland's guardian, urging him to drink deep and enjoy it because he was dear to them. So she's actually got like a big chalice. And... Um, if you're familiar with the idea of uh, communion where everyone drinks out of the same cup, that's this similar idea. But imagine these these men, right, at their tables and starting, of course, with the king because you always start with the king. Um, and often you would end with a special guest. Um, you'd have this this big sharing cup. And why would you share out of the same cup? I mean, they all have their own cups they're all drinking out of. Why would you share out of the same cup? Well, a couple of reasons. One, if you're sharing the same thing the king is sharing, right, that's special. That's honorable. And it's something that you do as a community. Two, if you're all drinking out of the same cup, that's part of trust, right? Because nobody you know if I have to drink out of it and so do you and so does everybody else then um, it's got to be safe to drink right it can't be poisoned um, and but uh, largely it's about honor and community here we go so imagine a really nice goblet with probably mead in it or maybe some wine So it goes to the king first. And he drank it down like the warlord he was with a festive cheer. So the helming women, woman went on her rounds, queenly and dignified, decked out in rings, offering the goblet to all ranks, treating the household and the assembled troop until it was Beowulf's turn to take it from her hand. So she's going around to everyone at the table, whatever their societal level is, and offering them a drink out of this cup. And they would replenish the cup as it goes. Um, but obviously, because there's a lot of guys. But again, she's walking right. It's honor. It's, uh, you know, you're taking a drink from the queen's hand. Yeah. Okay. Now she's coming to Beowulf. With measured words, she welcomed the Geat and thanked God for granting her wish that a deliverer she could believe in would arrive to ease their afflictions. He accepted the cup, a daunting man, dangerous in action and eager for it always. He addressed Wethelthrow, Beowulf, son of Ekthau, said, I had a fixed purpose when I put to sea. As I sat in a boat with my band of men, I meant to perform to the utmost what your people wanted or perish in the attempt, in the fiend's clutches. And I shall fulfill that purpose, prove it myself with a proud deed, or meet my death here in the mead hall. So this is him again giving his formal promise to the queen. I am here to do this mission, and I will do it, or I will die trying. This formal boast by Beowulf the Geat pleased the lady well, and she went to sit by Hrothgar, regal and arrayed with gold. 
Then it was like old times in the echoing hall. Proud talk and the people happy, loud and excited. Until, soon enough, Healthdane's heir had to be away to its nice rest. Remember, Healthdane's heir is Hrothgar the king. So soon enough, everything's great. It's like old times. They're partying. They're carrying on. It's wonderful. Until the king stands up. And when the king stands, everybody stands, right? And he's going to go to bed. Well, what happens every night when everybody goes to bed? Yeah. Grendel. So this is sort of like the turning point where where it's starting to set us up for the conflict we know is coming. He realized that the demon was going to descend on the hall, that he had plotted all day, from dawn light until darkness gathered again over the world, and stealthy night shapes came stealing forth under the cloud mark. So he knows Grendel's been plotting all day to attack, and just waiting for it to be dark enough. Because remember, he hates the sun because he hates God and, you know, the deeds you do in the darkness aren't seen by the light, etc., etc. Okay. The company stood, so this is all the men stand up, as the two leaders took leave of each other. Hrothgar wished Beowulf health and good luck, called, named him Hall Warden, and announced as follows. Never since my hand could hold a shield have I entrusted or given control of the Danes' hall to anyone but you. Ward and guard it, for it is the greatest of houses. Be on your mettle now. Keep in mind your frame. Beware of the enemy. There's nothing you wish for that won't be yours if you win through this alive. Okay, this is a big deal being hall warden. Because the king is in charge of his mead hall right? He might have guards and stuff, but he's the guy in charge. But he is leaving the Mead Hall and leaving Beowulf in charge. This is a big deal. This is a lot of trust. Hrothgar departed then with his house guard, the Lord of the Shieldings, their shelter in war, left the Mead Hall to lie with Wethelthrow, his queen and bedmate. The King of Glory, as people learned, had posted a lookout who was a match for Grendel, a guard against monsters, special protection to the Danish prince. And the Geat placed complete trust in his strength of limb and the Lord's favor. Again, we're getting that connection with religion, right? If Grendel is the, the Lord's hated, then Beowulf is the Lord's favor. Remember Beowulf said he was going to fight without weapons and without armor? Okay, jump down to 671. He began to remove his iron breast mail, took off the helmet, and handed his attendant the patterned sword, a smith's masterpiece, ordering him to keep the equipment guarded. And before he bedded down, Beowulf, that prince of goodness, proudly asserted, when it comes to fighting, I count myself as dangerous any day as Grendel. So, it won't be a cutting edge I'll wield to mow him down easily as I might. He has no idea of the arts of war, of shield or sword play, although he does possess wild strength. No weapons, therefore, for either this night. Unarmed shall he face me, if face me he dares. And may the divine lord in his wisdom grant the glory of victory to whichever side he sees fit. Okay, so once again, he's renewing the idea he's not going to use weapons. And it's kind of about honor, right? Because Grendel is a, basically a wild creature. So he's got a lot of strength, but he doesn't have intelligence. He doesn't have craft. He's not like planning out his positions for the battle. So Beowulf isn't going to use those things against him. He wants it to be as fair a fight as possible. Okay. Then, down the brave man lay with his bolster under his head, so he's got a pillow, he's laying down, and his whole company of sea rovers at rest beside him. None of them expected he would ever see his homeland again, or get back to his native place and the people who reared him. They knew too well the way it was before, how often the Danes had fallen prey to death in the mead hall. Okay, so as they're going to sleep, none of them expect to wake up alive or ever go home again, because they know what Grendel does. 
but our poet is going to give us a little more hope than that. But the Lord was weaving a victory on his war loom for the weather geats. Ooh, isn't that a great idea? Okay, you know the ancient Greek idea, right, of the ladies weaving your life and then cutting the string, right, from like Disney's Hercules and stuff? So here's the same idea, that God is weaving your fate, and so whatever he weaves is the pattern of your life. Through the strength of one, they all prevailed. They would crush their enemy and come through in triumph and gladness. The truth is clear. Almighty God rules over mankind and always has. So our poet is coming straight up and telling us how this is going to end and why. Then, out of the night, came the shadow stalker. Swift, stealthy and swift, the hall guards were slack, asleep at their posts, all except one. It was widely understood that as long as God disallowed it, the fiend could not bear to could not bear them to his shadow born. One man, however, was in fighting mood, awake and on edge, spoiling for action. Okay, so here comes Grendel, and everybody fell asleep except Beowulf. He's laying there pretending to be asleep, but he isn't really asleep. And again, just like he's done a few times in this poem, we're going to shift to Grendel's point of view, and we're going to, like, come up to the Mead Hall with him. Okay? So page 49, line 710. In off the moors, down through the mist bands, God-cursed Grendel came greedily loping. The bane of the race of men roamed forth, hunting for prey in the high hall. Under the cloud murk, he moved towards it until it shone above him, a sheer keep of fortified gold. Every, every time we're getting this description, we're getting the, the description of how beautiful it is and how golden it is, right? Nor was that the first time he'd scouted the grounds of Hrothgar's dwelling, although never in his life, before or since, did he find a harder fortune or har hall defenders. Okay, well, there, we, we kind of already know there is no going to be there is going to be no since, right? Because we already know the outcome of this battle. But that doesn't actually get in the way of our enjoying what's going to happen, does it? It's kind of interesting. It's like knowing how a movie ends, but the suspense is how it gets there. Okay, line 720. Spurned and joyless, he journeyed on ahead and arrived at the brawn. The iron-braced door turned on its hinge when his hands touched it. Then his rage boiled over. He ripped open the mouth of the building, maddening for blood, pacing the length of the patterned floor with his loathsome tread, while a baleful light, flame more than light, flared from his eyes. He saw many men in the mansion sleeping, a ranked company of kinsmen and warriors quartered together, and his glee was demonic. Picturing the mayhem, before morning he would rip life from limb and devour them, feed on their flesh. But his fate that night was due to change. His days of ravening had come to an end. So we have the quiet creeping, quiet creeping, quiet creeping, and then when he gets to the door, it's all noise and rage and anger. Mighty and canny, Higlock's kinsman was keenly watching for the first move the monster would make, nor did the creature keep him waiting. So Beowulf is like pretending to be asleep and, you know, and we've all done that, right? You've laid there in your bed or on the couch or something and, and people are doing stuff or the TV's on or whatever and you're totally pretending to be asleep. This is Beowulf. Okay, top of page 51. Uh, he didn't keep him waiting, but struck suddenly and started in. He grabbed and mauled a man on his bench, bit into his bone lappings, bolted down his blood, and gorged on him in lumps, leaving the body utterly lifeless, eaten up hand and foot. So the first thing he does is grab the first guy, rip him to pieces, and eat him up. This is not going to go well with Beowulf. That was one of Beowulf's guys that just got eaten. This is not going to end well for Grendel. Venturing closer, his talon was raised to attack Beowulf, where he lay on the bed. 
So the next guy he goes after is Beowulf, but of course Beowulf isn't really asleep, is he? He was bearing in with opened claw when the alert hero's comeback and arm lock forestalled him utterly. So here's Beowulf, right, reaching down, and this is really cinematic. He thinks Beowulf's asleep, and as he reaches down, suddenly Beowulf reaches up and grabs him and won't let go. The captain of evil discovered himself in a hand grip harder than anything he had ever encountered in any man on the face of the earth. Every bone in his body quailed and recoiled, but he could not escape. He was desperate to flee to his den and hide with the devil's litter, for, all, for in all his days he had never been clamped or cornered like this. Okay. All he wants to do is run. And you've seen this in animals, right? Even though sometimes animals will attack, especially if they think there's weaker prey to be had, as soon as they're challenged or as soon as something hurts them, all they want to do is get away. That is what Grendel wants to do. He's been grabbed. It's hurting. And it's the hardest gri grip he's ever had someone put on him. And he can't get away. Okay. Then Higlack's trusty retainer, Beowulf, recalled his bedtime speech, sprang to his feet, and got a firm hold. Fingers were bursting. The monster backtracked, the man overpowering. The dread of the land was desperate to escape, to take a roundabout road and flee to his lair in the fens. The latching power in his fingers weakened. It was the worst trip the terror monger had taken to Herat. And now the timbers trembled and sang, a hall session that harrowed every day and inside the stockade. Because Grendel's trying to run, Beowulf is pulling him back, right? And they're fighting and struggling, basically playing tug of war with Grendel's arm. And as they're doing this, right, the entire building is rocking. And um, the men are scared and they're hiding. Stumbling in fury, the two contenders crashed through the building. The hall clattered and hammered, but somehow survived the onslaught and kept standing. It was handsomely structured, a sturdy frame, braced with the best of blacksmith's work inside and out. The story goes that, as the pair struggled, mead benches were smashed and sprung off the floor, gold fittings and all. Before then, no shielding elder would believe there was any power or person on earth capable of wrecking their horn-rigged hall unless the burning embrace of a fire engulfed it in flame. Okay, and remember, we already know what happens to this. Eventually, the hall burns down. So we're getting, like, foreshadowing again. But this hall, remember, is the center of their community. It's the best hall ever. It's amazing. So the fact that it is holding strong during this enormous battle tells us right? That the community itself is going to hold strong. You with me here? We've got symbolism, the building representing the community. Okay, here we go. Picking up uh, line 781 in the middle. Then an extraordinary wail arose and bewildering fear overcame the Danes. So this is a new noise. Everyone felt it who heard that cry as it echoed off the wall. A God-cursed scream and strain of catastrophe. The howl of the loser, the lament of the hell surf keening his wound. He was overwhelmed, manacled tight by the man who of all men was foremost and strongest in the days of this life. So Grendel has stopped, isn't fighting so much. He's now screaming in pain. But the Earl Troop's leader was not inclined to allow his caller to depart alive. I'm not going to, just because he's hurting, just because I've hurt him, I'm not going to let him run away. And here's why. He did not consider that life of much account to anyone, anywhere. If I let Grendel go, he's not going to help anybody. He's just going to cause more destruction. Time and again, Beowulf's warriors worked to defend their lord's life, laying about them as best they could with their ancestral blades. Stalwart in action, they kept striking out on every side, seeking to cut straight to the soul. When they joined the struggle, there was something they could not have known at the time, that no blade on earth 
No blacksmith's art could ever damage their demon opponent. He had conjured the harm from the cutting edge of every weapon. But his going away out of this world in the days of his life would be agony to him, and his alien spirit would travel far into fiend's keeping. Okay, so as Beowulf is battling Grendel and the mead hall is shaking and everything's chaos and Grendel is screaming, Beowulf's men are jumping up and they've got their blades and they're trying to defend Beowulf and also take jabs at Grendel. But their swords do no damage whatsoever because Grendel has enchanted himself against weapons. Now Beowulf did not know this and they do not know this when he chose to fight the way he does. He didn't know that Grendel couldn't be hurt by weapons. But the fact that he's not using weapons to hurt him means that there's a possibility that he might win. Okay. Then he who had harrowed the hearts of men with pain and affliction in former times and had given offense also to God found that his bodily powers failed him. Higlak's kinsmen kept him helplessly locked in a hand grip. As long as either lived, he was hateful to the other. The monster's whole body was in pain. A tremendous wound appeared on his shoulder. Sinews split and the bone lappings burst. Beowulf was granted the glory of winning. Grendel was driven under the fenbanks, fatally hurt to his desolate lair. His days were numbered. The end of his life was coming over him. He knew it for certain, and one bloody clash had fulfilled the dearest wishes of the Danes. The men who lately landed among them proud and sure had purged the hall, kept it from harm. He was happy in his night work and the courage he had shown. The Geat captain had boldly fulfilled his boast to the Danes. He had healed and relieved a huge distress, unremitting humiliations, the hard fate they'd been forced to undergo, no small affliction. Clear proof of this could be seen in the hand the hero displayed, high up near the roof, the whole of Grendel's shoulder and arm, his awesome grasp. Okay, so how did Beowulf win this fight? He literally ripped Grendel's arm off. <coughs> Completely off. And then Grendel ran, because remember, he'd been trying to run. But he's bleeding out, and he goes down into his cave to die. Beowulf takes the whole arm and hangs it up in the rafters as a war trophy. So he can prove, I defeated him. I did what I said I was going to do. And this hall and this community is safe now, because Grendel's gone. Grendel's defeated. Okay, we are going to stop there because I've talked for quite a long time. When we pick up next, we're going to see what happens the next morning and the celebrations that happen among the people. Okay, so I want you to go into your notes, into Schoology, go into your notes, um, go ahead and open them up and add the new section. Okay, and I will see you back here for our next part.